Welcome to Beyond Conversations. Uh, in this series, we meet the protagonists of uh, today's technology landscape. And rather than uh, looking back and having them summarize their wonderful uh, experience and great success, uh, which unavoidably is also always tainted with at least a little bit of survivorship bias, we are uh, asking them to look forward. Uh, what is going to happen in the next one, five, ten, maybe twenty years? Uh, technology evolves, and uh, the challenges uh, are renewed uh, every day. Organizations and individuals can only succeed uh, if they adapt and uh, stay fit. Today's guest uh, is uh, Matt Mullenweg, uh, the uh, founder of uh, WordPress. And uh, I am so happy to have you, Matt, uh, here today with us. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here. So uh, even though uh, everyone knows WordPress, uh, which powers uh, something like uh, 40% uh, of uh, the planet's websites, uh, not everyone knows uh, how uh, it is organized. And uh, I think it is worth uh, talking about the fact that it is uh, uh, distributed, uh, everyone is remote, uh, mm -hmm. because for the past two years, uh, that has been uh, the way companies uh, that could afford it worked. Uh, and now they are asking themselves, should we go back to the old ways or not? What is your experience? Yeah, our structure is actually even more radical than that because there's actually two things called WordPress. Kind of three, but I'll say two. There's a WordPress.org and a WordPress.com. So WordPress.org uh, was started in 2003 and is an all-volunteer open source project. So that's people from all over the world working together, um, sometimes sponsored, but mostly not. To, because they want the software to exist. So it's very much like a Wikipedia or something like that. Um, tons of community, everything happens in the open. Anyone listening to this could get involved or join a meeting tomorrow or add their comments. And so sort of radically open and collaborative. Um, there's something called WordPress.com, which is the commercial hosting service, which was started in 2005 and is owned and run by my company, which is called Automatic. Um, Automatic was also distributed from the very beginning because our roots were in the open source. So it just made sense to work with people from around the world and, and get the best talent from around the world. Um, Automatic is now 2,000 employees. So those are people who get paid to work on Automatic's products. Um, about 100 of them donate their time uh, full-time, or we, do we donate their time full-time to the open source project. But the other 1,900 work on other commercial projects like Tumblr, WooCommerce, WordPress.com, um, our enterprise products. So a variety of essentially like sub-companies under this holding company called Automatic. And uh, the recommendation as a consequence is for every other company in the tech sector to emulate that kind of uh, remote first uh, uh, way of doing business. If they were not started fully remote, can they become fully remote? Companies can become fully remote, which we know because we acquire a lot of companies that that then move to being, they essentially adopt our culture, sometimes even without us asking them to. Um, now, do I want every tech company to do it? Well, not entirely, because then we would lose our advantage. <laughs> but let me tell you why perhaps the people smart enough to listen to your podcast should. Um, the number one reason, it's it's 100% true that in-person is amazing and you should get people together. But I think there's a diminishing margin return to having them together all year. I think you get a lot of, bit of, a lot of the benefit of being in-person two or three weeks out of the year, bringing people together. And the benefit you get from hiring from all around the world is access to the world's best talent. So in previous generations of tech companies, maybe it was true that you had to go to like a Boston college or Stanford or Berkeley or something like that to be one of the best engineers in the world. Now you just need an internet connection and motivation. And guess what? Turns out <laughs> all over the world, there's a ton of motivated people that never had access to go to these you know, colleges or maybe work at one of these companies already. 
but they're just as smart, if not more, than any of the folks I've ever interviewed from a major tech company. So if you're able to tap into that global talent pool, it's kind of like fishing in a bigger pond, right? Like versus fishing in a small <laughs> local pond, you're fishing in the global ocean of seven or eight billion people. And the best and brightest of those can be part of your company. And that just, it's a lot, it's a really great for culture. It's really great for, for diversity. It's really great for almost every measure that you want your company to be improving on. And, and so that is why you are saying it is uh, uh, one of the open secrets of the uh, reason why uh, uh, WordPress has been so successful because it has been able to really collect the best people from anywhere in the world. There is also, however, another uh, axis of um, organizational renewal that a lot of people are looking at today, and it is about uh, having... Uh, as flat an organization as possible, with as little middle, middle management as possible, pushing out decision making to the edges, uh, to the point where some of the units uh, may feel almost entirely autonomous. Now, the easy answer for you there is, oh yeah, that is how we work because all of the companies that we acquired uh, uh, are uh, autonomous uh, to a very large degree, but uh how flat is wordpress.com itself and do you would you like it to be flatter than it is today um so automatic does have a hierarchy so there are leads team leads you know leads of leads division leads etc and there's an org chart that eventually goes up to me at the top the layer below me is fairly flat and let me actually see right now it's a little extra because I'm currently directly running two of our divisions, WordPress.com and Tumblr, um, because we're going to do a lot of things between them. So um, that means I have a lot of direct reports, maybe like 35 right now. Wow, now, I don't mean? envy you. <laughs> well, actually, it's really great, because I think one of the advantages to at the middle levels or the higher levels, keeping things a little bit flatter, is it also keeps the lead, including myself, from meddling <laughs> on the downside or paying too much attention on the good side from any one of those uh, people, right? Just by definition, you know, there's going to be some parts, some of them I'm working with very closely at times, and some of them which are essentially doing their own thing, maybe for even like up to two or three months at a time. Uh, so that is, that's a trade-off, you know, and obviously with some folks, I will really dive in and work with them very, very closely for a period of time. But um, I think long-term people love autonomy. Uh, so if you can pair that with accountability, uh, I think it could be powerful, but I don't think it's um, a goal in and of itself. It's a means to an end. So autonomy is great if the team is doing well, and if they're not, the answer is probably not more autonomy. Maybe it is if if that was the lack of which was causing them not to do well. But often it means that maybe they need a different approach or some more attention would probably benefit them, or hopefully it would. When when Zappos uh, adopted the uh, holacracy, which empowered uh, everyone in the organization to be autonomous, uh, they offered an exit bonus for anyone who didn't feel they wanted to run with that experiment and uh, something like 20% of the people preferred to take the money and find an organization where they would still be told what to do. Uh, mm. So th that's very interesting. And, 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 and you're right. Not everyone is up to the responsibility of being fully autonomous. And I think, I don't know if it's entirely fair to put that motivation on them. Right, because it would be important to know like what their normal churn was, like, or were they churning fifteen percent a year anyway? And so it's just people can True. instead of designing, they can take some money out the door, or you know, I think there could be a lot of different reasons. Um, Holacracy is not my favorite. We had a group with an automatic that tried it, and what we found in our experiments, which of course was just one version, maybe it was not the perfect version of Holacracy or something, but was. Um, the, the team ended up switching back to a normal hierarchy, just to have a clear line of responsibility. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, you ended up kind of, they ended up recreating kind of a shadow hierarchy just for things that need like approval, like expenses or vacation, like whatever it was. I don't remember the exact things that kind of needed someone to, to check it off. They kind of ended up needing a hierarchy there anyway. So it yeah. ended up uh, recreating in a way that wasn't as clear. So we kind of just went back to where the hierarchy is very clear and, but how it's, uh, how it's implemented has a lot of flexibility, including like over the life cycle of someone's team. And then finally, just the emphasis that good ideas can come from anywhere. You know, the people at the top of the org chart are not the smartest or the best at all. Um, They don't even need to be the most highly paid. They, you know, they are there performing a role which serves the rest of the organization. And, um, but what really should matter to all of us is the end user results, the impact on the customer, you know, the quality of the code and the product. That's what really matters. Talking about end users, uh, if you ask uh, uh, different people in different parts of the world, what is internet for them? The answer will be there, very different. In many parts of the world where uh, um, zero.facebook.com uh, succeeded, uh, zero rating data uh, that people didn't need to pay for anymore. For example, uh, North, uh, North Africa, Northern Africa, uh, entire countries, the answer easily is going to be, oh, the internet is Facebook. Uh, in other parts of the world uh, where super apps um, uh, dominate, um, someone from China could say, well, the internet is WeChat. Uh, and a lot of um, uh, the buzz uh, around what is now uh, happening on the internet is around short form video, whether it is TikTok and the panic that it induced in Instagram and others. What do you feel the role of a predominantly text-based experience is that WordPress uh, promotes in the evolution of the internet as those examples represent? Yeah. Well, there's a few questions embedded in there. First, I'll say that WordPress is not just text. Just because we're WordPress, <laughs> we also do like other things really well and fast. Most um, major podcasts you probably follow are run on WordPress. WordPress is great for podcasting, for video casting, usually with integration with other tools. But for the actual content management part, it's probably the best in the world that you can use. Um, super apps, in the places where they've succeeded the most, I think it's important to also look at the broader context of the internet there, and particularly internet freedoms. So it behooves um, the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, which tries to control the internet in in China quite closely for everything to go through a few apps. So they really encourage that. And in fact, they force them to interop in some ways so that everyone uses like the WeChat identity or the supports Alipay or whatever it is. Um, Because that centralized experience is easier to easier to control and influence. I think in, call it Western and otherwise democracies or places where the internet is much more free, there will always be a counterbalance. We can have very successful companies like Google and Facebook, which I think is great. And their own success also creates challengers like DuckDuckGo or WordPress has always competed with Google's Bloodspot and other things like that. So it still allows upstarts or open source projects to create alternatives. And I think that's really great for end user freedom. So what I consider myself fighting for, I guess my life's work is, is freedom. And uh, my small slice of that that I work on is essentially digital freedom. <laughs> How is the software we use and publish with uh, making society more free or less free? And so it's important to me that the software is open source, which means you can use it in, for any purpose, whether I agree with you or not and widely deployable, so you can run it anywhere, and widely accessible. So those are sort of principles of WordPress. And, uh, you know, we'll see more of that in the world. And perhaps to the extent that the long arc of history shifts towards more freedom for people, which I hope it does. And I I hope, you know, I work on a very small slice of that. There's many more people working on more important slices of that, like human rights and others, uh, that will get more there. And perhaps someday... China could have a free and open internet for its citizens and they could access services like WordPress and Facebook and all these other things that they can't really access right now. 
Um, uh, one of the important components of uh, the mosaic of solutions that we need for delivering uh, this promise of freedom uh, is a reliable, independent, interoperable uh, online digital identities. Um, and even though it is becoming ever easier to sign up on platforms, the way that uh, this ease of use and uh, the improved user experience is delivered um, puts us in further and further entrenched data capture. If I log in with Facebook, if I log in with Apple, if I log in with Google, may I say, even if I log in with WordPress, uh, the identity is not owned by me, it's owned by the platforms. Uh, how do you see this evolving? Um, do you believe that one of the main um, use cases, for example, or do you agree rather than believe that one of the main use cases of uh, Web3 should be and should start from uh, a solid identity solution owned by the individuals? Um, no. <laughs> so let, let me tell you why as well. Um, I think that the solution for here, it's, it can be convenient to use a common Facebook or Google login for many services. And there's a lot of benefits to both the user and the service for supporting that. But I think what is most important is for people to take on different identities on different sites or even the same site, right? It's nice to have multiple accounts. And so for security, the evolution of essentially the password managers, which are kind of like digital identity wallets on the operating system or browser level, um, is where I think the innovation is happening. You probably saw with iOS 16, Apple is launching something which is essentially passwordless. Um, I use, you know, love like LastPass and OnePassword and things like that. But the built-in OS systems, like Keychain for Apple, are actually getting quite good, and including allowing other systems to interoperate, interoperate with them. So that, to me, is kind of the digital identity future I want, where users are not forced to use a single identity, including like an Ethereum wallet or anything like that, but can very easily have an ultra-secure um, and possibly even secret uh, identity. So something that's not necessarily public on a blockchain and that is not easy to hack or attack. Uh, let's remember as well that like running your own servers or own identity or own wallets in like crypto or Web3 is very, very dangerous. And we've seen so much, not just get stolen from individuals, but we're seeing the largest projects with hundreds of millions of funding get hacked almost every day. Uh, there was, what was the one that was just today? Uh, it was, let's see, uh, the Nomad Token Bridge, $190 million stolen. So if even some of the most sophisticated people in the world can't protect it, are we really gonna ask end users, <laughs> like, you know, you or me, to try to protect against that? No, it's good to delegate some of that to a centralized service. I, I very much agree with you that it is important to give the freedom to individuals to have multiple identities and to protect uh, uh, the uh, right to uh, a differentiated uh, self-expression, uh, depending on a role, on, a, on an age, uh, on, on even on a whim. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It's this is this... It's so popular with young kids, um, or I guess young adults, uh, because they love that they can put on and off different identities in their Tumblr very easily. We're like, we're not forcing you to use your real name or other things. That means we need to work a little harder to combat spam and stuff. But it's great. Like, also, you just might want different profiles online. Maybe I have one that's really into sports and one that's more into like fan fiction or. Perhaps it's a way for people to express an identity they're not even comfortable having public. So, for example, if they're LGBT and that's not widely respected within their community or family, it could be a way for them to express things like that, which I think is, is crucial and one of the best parts of the Internet. Yes. Um, you mentioned spam. Um, I happen to believe that uh, controlling and, and uh, maintaining um, a, a healthy environment uh, is crucial. However, yes. spam is practically impossible to eliminate. So 
what I wish is to find platforms that embrace bots instead, where <laughs> positive outcomes achieved through what traditionally would be called spam, automated communication, uh, could very simply out-evolve and outnumber the negative uh, uh, fraudulent uh, uh, outcomes. Uh, my favorite example is uh, that uh, LinkedIn uh, turns users into bots by providing them pre-generated responses to <laughs> messages, yeah. but at the same time prohibits you from setting up uh, a bot that would meet with the bot of another user to work out if there is a reason to connect. Uh, what, what do you see the role of uh, uh, automation in um, allowing people to do things they do best rather than policing uh, platforms? Uh, uh, even reporting bots is a chore uh, that on Twitter, for example, I just don't want to do. I receive dozens of uh, uh, spam messages and I don't want to spend spend my time in um, training the filters that apparently don't even try to work. That's a tough one. Um, as we see in email, which is a really open protocol, which is amazing. You can email, email any email address in the world. The downside is sometimes the spam filters can be aggressive and they make mistakes. So you do need some user feedback system and nothing will ever be perfect. Uh, you kind of have to err on the side of blocking less or blocking more. For some, I run my own email server, so a lot of my email I send, it gets caught in other people's spam folders quite a bit, which is sometimes hilarious. <laughs> uh, I don't think that's a solvable problem. It's always going to be an all arms race. Should platforms allow more scripting? The good news is that even if they don't officially allow it, the nature of the web means that there, if people want it, there can always be like a Chrome extension or some other way of essentially hacking the API um, to be indistinguishable from a human. <laughs> and this is The spammers do this as well, um, but this can be used for legit users as well. And particularly if it's not, if it's rate limiting itself, so not moving too fast or other things, um, I, I think it's very trivial <laughs> to automate uh, anything that can be done in a browser. Um, you you mentioned uh, openness as a driving principle for your endeavors, uh, and you mentioned uh, open source. Um, mm -hmm. We don't want to get into the weeds of the uh, all the open source versus free software uh, debate, uh, but it has been, I think, remarkable how uh, basically open source won not only as uh, witnessed by the success of uh, WordPress itself, but also Facebook, Google, Microsoft couldn't do what they are doing now were it not for all the open uh, libraries that, uh, that they uh, adopted, um, including the data that they uh, vacuumed up and now they are chewing through and then delivering via ever more sophisticated AI algorithms. And this has been an arms race too. Uh, I didn't check uh, because I didn't realize it would come up uh, before our conversation. If uh, the, the, the trial um, where Oracle is trying to stop, uh, I think Google, yeah. using their APIs uh, has been decided oh, yet okay. yeah. uh, because Oracle pretends that that uh, um, the API can only be used uh, based on certain permissions. So um, another very interesting uh, evolution of the open source battle was the acquisition of GitHub by Microsoft, uh, which was a, a watering hole for so many open source projects until uh, the Cuban or Iranian developers uh, realized that uh, they were kicked off the system and uh, with no appeal, no um, even uh, 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 alert that it would happen, 
many of them losing the code. Um, so how do you see this uh, arms race evolving in, in uh, the open source uh, world? There's a th few threads to unpack there. So first, you know, I said what I, I fight for is freedom. So I didn't necessarily openness. And the reason I use the word freedom is because I think privacy is a really important part of freedom. You know, it's, it's a basic human right, the right to privacy, I believe. Uh, if people choose to publish openly, that's great. And I'll choose to do that myself. But it's also really important for people to be able to have private data, private lives, private thoughts, private everything. Um, you mentioned developers getting blocked from Iran or Cuba. I would characterize that not as really a Microsoft or GitHub issue, but just a any business doing business in the United States. So sometimes startups forget to do that stuff. And then like later down the line, they're like, oh yeah, we can't do business with a sanctioned country. <laughs> or This or is, this is like not the first time, well. however, that Microsoft yeah. is uh, doing the same. Uh, when they acquired uh, Skype, the first thing they did was to centralize uh, the servers, proudly running them on uh, whatever they were calling it at the time, if not already Azure. Uh, and, um, and there was an open letter uh, signed by every other tech uh, company asking them, does this mean that now Skype is backdoored? Uh, mm. And uh, it was just a couple of months before the Snowden uh, revelations. So the open letter didn't need to get an answer because it was kind, it became kind of obvious. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah apologies, I though. I, I interrupted you. You said there were different threads in my question about the evolution of, of uh, open systems and freedoms that come with them. Yeah. Ultimately, anyone running a business does so under some country's jurisdiction. And so U.S. businesses, like I have a U.S. business called Automatic, we have to follow the laws of the U.S., which means whatever my personal feelings towards people in North Korea or Cuba or Iran or desire to like create something for those users, I can't directly do business with them or I'd be violating like a bunch of important laws. <laughs> and there's good reason for those laws. And ultimately, we have a social contract with our leaders we elect to, you know, uh, create those. And then our end of that bargain is to follow them, <laughs> you know, follow particularly just laws. Now, if something's purely open source, meaning the software can be downloaded and run, or is more of a protocol, uh, even if there's a sanction, there's basically no real way to enforce that because someone, for example, in Iran could download the code and run it themselves. And there'd be no way to effectively block that if they were you know, using a proxy or something to get the code. So I think that open source is still very accessible even under authoritarian regimes. And in fact, the US even sponsors certain projects like Tor and others to allow folks in those regimes to try to evade some of the censorship. So again, often it's important to distinguish. Um, you know, earlier I, I spoke about the CCP versus China or Chinese people. Like obviously citizens of a country are not responsible for all the actions of their leaders of the country. <laughs> and usually when countries fight, <laughs> it's not like all the people versus all the other people. It's, you know, usually in response to an action. You know, one this year that's on a lot of people's minds is like Putin's and the Russian military's invasion of Ukraine. <laughs> that does not reflect, you know, the rich and diverse and, you know, intellectually amazing culture and history of, of all the people in Russia. And so I just think it's important to remember that as well when we talk about often use a country's name as kind of a, a shortener for the actions of its leaders and distinguish that from the will or <laughs> even sometimes like, you know, the actions of, of its people. Um, so that was a little bit of a sidebar, <laughs> but I just thought it was important to mention. Yes. Um, we mentioned uh, uh, data as an incredibly valuable resource uh, for the development of uh, the latest AI algorithms that uh, are delivering uh, astonishing results, both in text and in image uh, generations. Uh, GPT-3, Dolly 2 and, and others are taking even experts by surprise, not only because of the quality of their output, uh, but because apparently, at least for the time being, uh, the performance um, 
uh, gradient uh, hasn't been uh, tapering off. You That's increase amazing. the amount of data and the quality of the results uh, keeps uh, increasing. Um, what is, uh, in, in, in your opinion, the role of these tools in empowering uh, creators that uh, use uh, your, your platforms? Well, first, I'll say if someone hasn't heard or played with DALL-E2, it's spelled D-A-L-L-E uh, from OpenAI, it is one of the closest things to magic and technology you'll see. It's really incredible. From simple text prompts, the images it can create, images that have never existed in the world, and it can do it in a variety of art styles, watercolors, pencil drawings, you know, in the style of Basquiat, in the style of Monet, you can do it. It's really incredible. Um, what I think of these things as, oh, thanks for showing that, yeah, as essentially like new tools that can increase the, um, like the levers <laughs> of, of human creativity. So for example, um, Dolly can create anything you ask it, but it doesn't know what to ask. <laughs> so just like an instrument, like a piano or a saxophone, increases the range of uh, the artist playing it. You know, to do things they might not be able to do with their voice normally. Um, I think that these tools like Dolly are going to increase the uh, accessibility and creative output of the global imagination of the world. And for WordPress in particular, you know, it's very common for people to like search for stock images or things like that. So how cool would it be if you're writing a blog post to just have the AI create an illustration of anything you can imagine that like perfectly is like, if you could if you could draw really well, you'd create it, but probably take you many hours. And in literally seconds, the AI can generate it for you. Um, it's not perfect, right? And I think there's also going to be an art to writing the prompts. The prompts are the things that tell the AI what to create. Um, just kind of like it's, you know, Google was the first version of this. Like you can find anything in the world on Google, but you have to ask it the right way. <laughs> <laughs> and some people are better than others, and there's tricks to do on your Google searches. I think there's going to be a similar skill and art to writing great AI prompts. And in fact, there was the first book I've seen of nothing but prompts. I forget what it was called, but if you search for probably like Dolly prompt book, it's a free and open source book or, or freely available book. And just it says what the prompt was and what the image was created. It's incredible. Like just I, if again, if you want to understand the power of this, given the right prompting, um, check out that book. So um, you said something very interesting. Uh, my my personal motto is: What is the question that I should be asking? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, in in recognition of of, of what you just said, uh, that as long as we have the tools, the ability of using those tools powerfully depends on our imagination and our creativity. And and you said in Google you can find anything as long as uh, you ask the right question. So while you were talking, I said, "How can I set up WordPress?" Mm -hmm. And Google gives you a set of uh, answers. Uh, the first oh, entire that? page, hearkening oh, back to oh. Yahoo in the nineties, the entire first screen is advertising. It feels desperate. I'm. I feel sorry for Google. Uh, but uh, then as you uh, scroll down, because you grew blind to the ads, of obviously you don't even see them. This is very interesting because Google is starting to suggest the That's questions. Cool. That's cool. And as you click on one of them, the rest of the list reforms. For example, this one, is WordPress easy to set up? wasn't in the original list of questions. Mm. So you can start using Google as a question generator for a topic that you are unsure about. That's really cool. <laughs> so um, you um, agree that uh, these AI tools are a great platform for creators working on WordPress that and, and 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 I don't know if it already exists, but uh, um, here's here's in question form. How long do you believe it will take 
for a WordPress plugin to be coded that suggests in the in the admin dashboard or in the editor uh, sorry not suggest th th yes that 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 generates a prompt based on your text the, as you are writing as you are blogging and if you connect it with dali or via your api key it is just one click to then generate the image that you may want to use as an illustration for for your post is it yeah, do, you, do you give it more than two months it. yeah that'll happen i right? think soon very rapidly very rapidly um, i also think it's great for like maybe the ai can suggest new things for you to write about yeah maybe you can we already have it where it checks our spelling and our grammar and improves our writing so i mean the history of modern humanity is us being augmented by technology like by some definition of cyborg as soon as we started wearing glasses <laughs> which was pretty early like we started augmenting our human abilities and i think that has every time it happens we get worried probably rightly so because we want to make sure that we use technology in the right way but the fears <laughs> of of the you know how technology is going to destroy society are pretty much always unfounded and you know i saw someone say the other day um you know they predicted that we'd run out of food already or that the population would ex collapse like the malthusians or something like that underestimated our one inexhaustible resource which is human ingenuity i wish i could remember who said that i just saw it the other day so full credit to them that's not me but i thought that was such a beautiful idea that the human spirit human creativity human ingenuity um doesn't mean that we don't create problems or have problems but that we um we can come together to solve them and it's incredible i mean look at what we did with covid that we had vaccines within days and a billion doses produced within a year like that's unthinkable and it shows that when we really work together what we can accomplish and that's part of why i love open source because open source is almost like an amish barn, barn raising for for software the whole community comes together agrees on something we're going to build together and that makes it and it's really incredible what you can do and that's why i think open source does so well over the long term as well and and uh, deep mind uh, must be absolutely applauded uh, not only for creating alpha fold which mm -hmm. um, generated the shapes of now every known protein oh. but releasing the database free and open including commercial applications cool so just uh, uh, the, the the maximum degree of uh, freedom that that you can wish for it's also funny that we're bad at predicting so if you asked people 30 years ago or even 10 years ago maybe we probably like i might have predicted we're going to have self-driving cars by now or robots able to do more like basic things that, like an infant can do like walk around <laughs> <laughs> um, and I wouldn't have predicted that like illustrators <laughs> were going to be something that were essentially the AI got better at before it was able to, you know, walk around. Yeah. Uh, now, funny you say we are bad at predicting because my next question was to huh. make you predict the next <laughs> uh, 20 years uh, of, of uh, WordPress uh, and, and automatic. Um, uh, so, Let's start with, with five. Um, a, a lot of uh, work has been done uh, to make WordPress both powerful and easy to use. Um, but uh, probably uh, if you ask a non-technical person, they will still feel a bit overwhelmed by it. Um, so I would guess making it still easier uh mm -hmm. while very hard is an important objective what other uh directions what other vectors of evolution you you want wordpress to excel in over uh, the next uh, uh decade maybe yeah i like to think about and i think i got this from jeff bezos but like look at what's never going to change Right, a lot changes, but so 
Yeah, you mentioned easier to use. People are always going to want that, right? Because they're their lives are busy. <laughs> they have a lot of things they want to do. So everything we can make it easier to use is better. More secure. No one wants to get hacked. Your WordPress has become way more secure. It can always become more. Performance. So speed of how it you, it updates, it delivers, and how the pages serve. We can work the rest of our lives on that. Like we should always be getting better every release. Um, so those are three that I think are not going to change. Right? <laughs> no matter what else changes, people always want to be faster, more secure, and uh, more intuitive to them. Is 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 one of your objectives to end up in an antitrust uh, problem because eighty percent of the world's uh, websites will be run on WordPress? Well, the good news is that uh, I can't think of any open source project that's ever been an antitrust because part of the freedom is the freedom to change it and use it for any purpose. So usually antitrust is about companies abusing you know, their control, but no one, including me, has really control over WordPress. <laughs> it's really not any control over how you use it. So that's the cool thing about open source is it becomes more popular. It becomes, it increases the freedom in the world versus things controlled by a single company. And um, yeah, so that's why open, you never hear about open source and open uh, antitrust. Uh, even though Linux, et cetera, are, are utterly dominant now in many of the areas, databases, et cetera. Um, so that's why I like working on it too. <laughs> so <laughs> so like, WordPress can uh, increase uh, uh, unbounded uh, to whatever percentage uh, and it won't, be, it won't become a problem. I it, think our only limit is our responsiveness to our users. So if WordPress stops being responsive to its community, it goes away. Like there's so many examples of open source programs failing, far more failed than succeed. And the extent that we remain really responsive to our community, then you know, hopefully that community can grow and grow and grow. Um the the, the way we interact with computers uh, will change. It has already changed a lot. Uh, uh, our phones are the main uh, tool uh, for most people in interacting with computers. Uh, smart speakers uh, appeared uh, uh, for maybe a short period of time to uh, gain traction, but uh, the clunkiness of uh, uh, their limited understanding of natural language, at least for the moment, uh, makes their usefulness uh, questionable. In, in my uh, experience, they speak up uh, uh, over eager to help yeah. <laughs> uh, when you you actually didn't uh, mention their names uh, even um what uh, do you think uh, are going to be the uh, interfaces of the future and let me ask you a very specific um example or question around that is the current enthusiasm around immersive shared three-dimensional uh, systems, aka the the, the metaverse, mm -hmm. um, excessive. Will it be tempered by the inability of the hardware software combination to live up to the expectations? Until a new wave, maybe maybe ten years from now, will deliver on those. Well, that's a good question. Um... Screens are really nice, <laughs> you know? A screen can exist in the real verse, right? And you can move it around, you share it really easily, multiple people can watch it. And screens have gotten so much better over the past 20 years. It's, it's literally awe-inspiring. And that's TVs, it's computers, it's phones. When you think of the resolution of like the original iPhone, it would be like barely a thumbnail on your current iPhone's pixels, you know? And so, as those have gotten better, I feel like they do become more immersive. And I, I'm kind of on the side, like the metaverse has been here for dozens of years. <laughs> like maybe it was different interfaces, but like when I was a kid on IRC and web forums with an identity I made up, an avatar, like that was a version of the metaverse. And you know what? That was awesome because <laughs> I was able to like connect with people on the internet around shared passions. I was able to learn a ton and, um, and sort of be not tied or held back by my real world identity, which was like, you know, 
a pimply faced kid in Houston <laughs> who didn't have a college degree or anything like that. You know, I could sort of be judged by just the content of my mind and my work than necessarily how I looked, color of my skin, age, anything like that. So I think that's a really cool concept and one of the coolest parts of the internet. None of us can control how or where we're born, but on the internet, you can kind of like be born again <laughs> as often as you want. You can create new identities. And that's what part of the reason I feel that that freedom is really important. Now, whether that becomes like AR or VR or something like that, I find these things fun right now. I think they're hard to spend all day in. And, um, but I don't know if I can correctly predict the curve of that technology, um, whether it will be one of the ones that ends up being kind of a technological dead end, as has been many before, um, or whether it becomes you know, closer to how like cell phones evolve right now. Uh, but let's not forget that on video games and other things. What Facebook is promising is already here and, in, and really amazing, um, particularly video games like Roblox or Minecraft or other things. It, you um, spoke uh, of being a cyborg, um, uh, assuming you wear glasses. <laughs> uh, do you find... Uh, thinking about your own limits of uh, where you would push uh, your being a cyborg uh, to and where you would stop uh, clearly uh, relegating yourself uh, to the past? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of on the side of like, give me the technology as soon as it's safe. <laughs> you know, and, and and I think we do this Again, we forget how we do this with like, whether it's vaccines or antibiotics or other things, like even the fact that we live to, you know, past our 40s now, by and large, is, is the advantage of things like antibiotics and other treatments. So um, the next So you don't mind life, being a little bit conservative uh, 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 around that? I don't mind being an early adopter. <laughs> okay. I don't want to be first. Uh, well, but... uh, uh, beta testers um, get burned by the bugs, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, I don't know uh, my tolerance for the bugs uh, uh, of my brain implant, uh, right? Uh, I, I, I don't know how long I want to wait uh, until the early adopters work out the bugs instead. Yeah, but also early adopters get rewarded yeah. you know, by something or, or taking advantage of it sooner so like you know whatever Neuralink or brain computer interfaces yeah i'll definitely try that out um as we figure out new nootropics or other just like caffeine is a molecule we figured out that sort of enhances our productivity or focus or things um i'm not aware of anything else <laughs> with a similar like risk reward curve but assuming there was something that was very low risk very you know not harmful and you know safe sure sign me up <laughs> um, uh, I I realize realize right that... experiment on yourself is also an important freedom right that's right, um, that's right. so like i 100 agree like we need regulations and you shouldn't be allowed to do things to others but for people to essentially have liberty over their own body to like try new things sure um, uh, when we mentioned the identity I realize I, I had a question in mind, and uh, even though uh, it is much more concrete than not uh, the, the latest uh, about cyborgs that we uh, were addressing uh, in the conversation, I want to go back to it because it is still very important and it's going to be Im important in the future too. And it is about payments uh, on the internet. Um, the current uh, system dominating of uh, credit cards is uh, 70 years old, uh, uh, creaky and uh, belonging to the past uh, century, actually millennium. Uh, and uh, the original architects of the internet uh, were aware uh, of, of the need to the point that they coded an error code. 404 is the missing page. 402 is the missing payment mechanism. And then for 30 years, everyone ignored uh, the, 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 the problem. Um, do you think Bitcoin, Lightning in particular, uh, or some similar solutions 
on a public blockchain are going to represent the native payment mechanism for future um, internet-based uh, systems? Hmm. I think they'll they'll be used a lot more than they are today. I think there's a strong use case for an anonymous version of that. So like a Zcash or Monero or MobileCoin or whatever is kind of the next generation that becomes a successful. I also don't think we should count out our traditional payment rails, you know, credit card systems and others. And there's been really cool stuff. Like, I don't know if you followed the um, uh, unified payments interface in India, UPI. Absolutely. Yes. I think, you know, right now, our advantage of our sort of trad fire, traditional finance rails is it's actually extremely high volume. Uh, it can be instant, right? Like when we pay our credit card or tap our credit card, we're not waiting around to like take our coffee. It's like basically instant. Um, transaction fees are kind of high, but consumers don't really care. Merchants mostly are built into their business model. But I think there's going to be a downward pressure on transaction fees. Perhaps that'll be regulatory as well probably led by the EU, would be my guess. Um, and there's no reason we can't make those faster, more widely accessible, and cheaper. Um, I think that also we shouldn't forget that as a consumer, let's say in the US using credit cards, we get a ton of benefit from that as well. So two I'll point out is one, like flexibility of uh, paying it back. <laughs> so the whole idea of credit, the credit and credit cards is really valuable to a ton of Americans to break up those payments versus like, you know, if it's not in my wallet, I can't buy it. <laughs> that would hold a lot of people back. And credit and debt is an amazing invention that provides a lot of flexibility for people. And two is, I would say, dispute uh, resolution. So, you know, between Amex and a merchant, if a credit card is charged either without my permission, there's a way for that to be resolved, or second, if it's charged with my permission and then the merchant does not deliver the services I thought I bought and agreed on, there's a whole chargeback procedure. And so we essentially have this um, process by which merchants and like American Express can advocate on our behalf for consumer protection. And by the way, that's awesome. <laughs> this is really amazing. You don't have that in irreversible crypto transactions, at least that I've currently seen. Perhaps there could be a smart contract or something, but as the ones that I've used, tend to be one way and irreversible, much like a, a, a money order or, or handing someone cash. So um, let's, I think that let's not forget some of the advantages, particularly consumers, of some of these more traditional financial uh, systems. And you know, there's a reason all the regulations around that exist, as we're seeing a little bit in what I call the wildcat era of crypto, which is working its way out a little bit right now. But you know, the, the bank runs, the failures, the people losing tons of money and things they thought were safe deposits. Um, it's not dissimilar to like what the U.S. financial system went through 100 years ago. <laughs> and then we, we made a lot of rules to say, oh, let's not do that. <laughs> we want people to be sure of the risk they're taking. Uh, you, you mentioned that privacy uh, is, is an important uh, right, and I, I, I totally agree. Any um, society that uh, doesn't recognize the ability for an individual to evolve uh, and diverge by the recognized norms uh, and only through the minority opinions becoming majority opinions uh, achieving a new uh, social contract will break apart uh, because individuals will say, well, I am still who I am uh, mm -hmm. And I will do the things I want to do, regardless of what uh, what society believes uh, um, I should. Um, and and uh, whether me, sorry to interrupt, but I also want to add in there that fundamental rights are also really important for protecting minority groups. And there's yes. many examples of that through history. So, but I think you need to have those. You have majority will, but you also have some protection of hopefully inalienable rights that are enabled by a constitution or something similar in different countries or just human yes. rights. We agree like and, local and, are and, and, and privacy is what allows unrecognized minority rights to become recognizable because they are not extinguished at the source. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to put uh, it. So, um, Creative Commons and and uh, um, uh, the 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 uh, 
GPL, the GNU uh, General Public License, um, have been also kind of uh, uh, regulatory innovations, if you wish, right? They, they uh, hacked uh, the under, underlying system of copyrights in the first uh, of, of uh, uh, software uh, licenses in the second. Um, and you mentioned that uh, you feel the EU uh, will drive uh, regulatory innovation in traditional finance. Now, what I wonder is whether the EU is now putting itself in a position to be the regulatory innovator. So, for example, privacy, the GDPR, has quotation marks infected all the world because any website uh, that has EU people registering uh, uh, has to be GDPR compliant. Um, the um, uh, innovation around uh, 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 telecoms uh, interoperability that uh, drove down mobile uh, costs uh, with with roaming charges now basically non-existent uh, in the EU and many others. Oh, AI ethics, where explainability of AI is now a major drive, uh, financed with a billion uh, euro by by the EU, and and uh, potentially being imposed on platforms and so on. Um, I have the feeling, and I, I want to hear your opinion that. It is, however, falling overboard, believing that regulatory innovation is enough, mm -hmm. as if it could drive technology. Um, do you do you have any any opinion around that? Hmm. It's funny because I simultaneously believe in the supreme importance of good regulation for free markets. And also that so often the regulation has unintended effects and can slow markets down. So GDPR, I think had the intention of protecting privacy, had the effect of solidifying the duopoly of Facebook and Google <laughs> and you know making these horrible cookie banners we all have to click now, <laughs> which kind of, I don't feel like effectively approve Privacy, really, you know, it's uh, they're just annoying. So another famous one, have you heard of the Cobra effect? No. It's, I guess, maybe in India or someplace, like probably the British colonial government. But this could be a made up story, but this still the effect is cool. You know, they there were too many Cobra snakes. And so they said, like, hey, we'll pay you a bounty for, <laughs> if you give us a Cobra snake. The perverse incentive is that people started breeding them <laughs> to... To uh, you know, so that wasn't what they were trying to incense, but incentives are powerful and they can have unintended side effects. So, um, yeah, th those seem like kind of at opposite ends, but I think it's just important. Hmm, what's the way to put this? The final ingredient is regulatory capture, which is typically referred to as like the ability of large organizations or powerful people or people with a lot of money to influence the creation of the regulations, which often solidifies their benefit, even if it has a consumer-friendly name on it. I'm not sure there's solutions for those, to be honest. And uh, one, one it's hack, kind of the problem of government. One, one hack uh, that would be relatively easy to implement is, is a meta rule that said every regulation must have an automatic sum setting mm -hmm. so that it has to be re-evaluated under a renewed set of circumstances, technologies, and understandings. It would add an enormous cost in terms of the democratic process of legislation and approval. Mm -hmm. But my belief is that added cost would be worth it in terms of of the speed of improvement of the of the regulations and they are being up to uh, the expectations of that current set of players in the market. It's interesting because it's it's an iterative game and an adversarial process. So if you'd asked me a few years ago, I probably would have said 
the meta rule that's really powerful is increasing the responsiveness of governments to its citizens. And what I would have thought was the most important thing there was like voting rights, <laughs> which in the U.S. Is, is still something that's actually remarkably fought over <laughs> and really bad in some places. So in the U.S. we have gerrymandering, voter ID laws, lots of things that limit people's access to vote, which is, I, I think, probably making government less responsive to its citizens. Now, that said, it doesn't matter if you have voting rights, if the voters themselves are being influenced by misinformation <laughs> or foreign governments or malicious actors. And so how do you protect the freedom of speech for the citizens and also protect the country information attacks, which are just as, you know, can be just as devastating as kinetic attacks um, on the population? Um, that's a really tough one. <laughs> <laughs> right. And in the U.S., one of the things that changed us the most was the Citizens United uh, Supreme Court case, which basically said money is freedom of speech and corporations can spend as much money as they want to influence politics because that's a freedom of speech. I'm simplifying it, but uh, that uh, has had a lot of unintended effects on our political process by bringing tons of money and therefore influence into things. Um, and I'm not sure the solution for that, to be honest. Um we we must uh, uh, address the challenge of uh, evolving and improving uh, uh, our political processes all over the world. Um, the onus is certainly on the democratic uh, countries and uh, forms of, of government to prove themselves more viable, resilient, innovative, and... Uh, uh, correspondent to the needs of of, uh, of their residents, uh, uh, dictatorial regimes don't feel the need of uh, evolving. They feel the need of preserving their their position. So, um, may I add something in there that could be a solution? Yeah. Yes. Um, if we had increased mobility between countries, so that would allow people to vote with their feet and paying their taxes and their sort of economic activity to regimes or governance uh, structures, which are more amenable to what they feel is like the ideal. We get this a little bit in the United States with like movement between states, which is fairly free right now. Um, and between countries, we typically have some sort of barriers for immigration, usually with concerns of people taking undue resources. But imagine if instead of saying like just paying taxes, you could pay a fee to be like, we allow anyone in the world into the United States if you can pay 30 grand a year or something like that. There's just like a membership fee. Like it's a uh, cool, right? Who would that attract? What would it like, you have to pay a certain amount. You have to follow these rules, pay taxes. Like, you know, there's some, some sort of contract, but then whoever can do that is allowed. Um, and what if every country had that version? I could go to Canada, I could go to Britain, I could go to Spain, I could go to Japan, like with some sort of like thing that assures I'm not, that I'm a net add to the society. And, uh, and then other than that, like my economic activity is all sort of accruing to the local country. Um, it's a fun idea to play with, kind of like Balaji's network states. Um, to increase right. there, there, there are already countries uh, at the higher threshold of, uh, let's say, half a million uh, that uh, will sell you their their passports uh, or um, give you long-term uh, residence uh, uh, rights. So uh, what we are now looking at is the uh, potential for the threshold uh, to go down rather than half a million, 50,000, and then rather than 50,000, 5,000. The U.S. is an interesting example because the opposite is happening. The cost and the length of renouncing U.S. citizenship which brings with itself universal taxation is growing exponentially, which to me is 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 very interesting because it basically uh, uh, defines the U.S. as a feudal state, uh, where by <laughs> birth you belong, and soon um, uh, the, the 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 vast majority of the population will not be able to afford to ever leave if they chose. Uh, to to do so, but the experiment that you mentioned will be played out, even if we don't want to, and we wouldn't. We 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 don't want, but it will be happening due to climate change, where uh, hundreds of millions of people uh, will need uh, 
the help of everyone else to relocate because very simply their uh, original place of residence will be unlivable. Uh, the wet bulb effect is what I'm keeping an eye on, uh, where the, uh, the combined uh, uh, values of temperature and humidity yeah. make it so that mammals cannot shed heat. Uh, so without uh, technology helping you, uh, air con reliable air conditioning. Jesus, there's a ton of energy. You die. You die. Yeah. And and uh, whether in Pakistan or India or in a few other places of the world, we are now reaching that uh, level. And for me, it will be a great test of uh, can we call ourselves uh, a human civilization and a humane civilization uh, that uh, we, we, we will need to help those people move out. And it is not going to be a few thousand, but it will be many, many, many millions that will need to move. You have to have so predictions. That will one. be it. Yes. I, I think the problem you said is, is very real. I think relocating hundreds of millions of people is unimaginable. I just don't think we we could do it. We have enough trouble with a few million refugees. How could we do it? Right. And you see the political instability that creates you know, just with a small, relatively small number. So I I don't think there'll be a global agreement on it, but I think some country is going to essentially um, do unauthorized geoengineering experiments to turn on the global temperature. It happens naturally through volcanoes and things. And so, you know, I think there's some sci-fi actually that talks about this where like India just does this like a secret yeah, team. Yeah, Neil, Neil like Stephenson who wrote uh, in the Snow Crash, which predicted uh -huh. uh, the metaverse, his latest book uh, is Termination Shock. And, uh -huh. and, and, and yes, that is exactly what it is about. Uh, 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 a geoengineering uh, to to bring down uh, temperatures. Very funny. Well, hopefully, that's not like the Matrix where we accidentally black out the sun and you know it's some unintended side effect. But um, yeah, there is some promising stuff there, uh, and it's not too late for some of these things um, to be tried. Uh, Matt, uh, it was wonderful to 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 speak to you today. Uh, I hope uh, we can uh, have another conversation maybe in a few years to see how uh, the uh, uh, WordPress uh, automatic ecosystem uh, is evolving and uh, delivering value to millions and, and hundreds and of millions or maybe billions of people uh, all over the world. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, I, I thank you. It was uh, really a pleasure uh, talking with you today. Thank you as well. And thank you to the audience. Thank you, everyone, for uh, being uh, here uh, with us today for Beyond uh, Conversations. I hope you enjoyed it, and I am looking forward to welcome you with our next guest soon.